Oshio. I wanted to share something with you. I wanted to give you something to think about. And the thing is, I want you to understand what I say to you applies for me. It's when I say for you to think about, I'm talking about for me and for you, for us all. And I wanted to share some passages of scripture with you, but I want to encourage you to be like the Bereans in the book of Acts, who when Paul came and started uh, proclaiming the gospel, all right, they looked up into the scriptures, and by the way, the scriptures that they had looked up through was in the Old Testament. Okay, to, to verify everything that what Paul was saying was the truth. Okay, so the thing is, a lot of times people just take for granted that the preacher and everyone, you know, uh, well, you know, they've been a pastor for 20 years, and they have had, look at this big church, they must be telling the truth, you know, I mean, after all, they got Reverend, our Dr. So-and-so's name, you know, right there, so they must know. Understand, even men who's been in uh, pastoring churches and, you know, living for God for years can get it wrong. You know, uh, some intentionally for obvious this reasons and others unintentionally so therefore yes you should listen to the man of god but mind you look it up all right that's what we're supposed to do but i, I want to touch on a subject that it affects all who want to follow christ or those who saying or following Christ. I want to give you something to to think about in your walk, okay? Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Um, excuse me, not 20, but uh, it's chapter 19, all right? And we'll do verse 28 and 29. Now, Peter had made a question to Jesus, and he says, See, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? All right, and now verse 28 reads as follows. This is Jesus' reply. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And by the way, that's for the twelve disciples, uh, not for, not the, uh, us. You know, it says twelve, okay. I just need you to, some people do get that misconstrued here. All right, well, let's go on, all right. It says, and everyone who is left, now listen to this, and everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and, and inherit eternal life. Now, by the way, some preachers love to use that, trying to have use it for prosperity. The gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. You know, you'll make me richy. All this, and God will bless you, make me rich, and He'll bless you to make me even more richer. They have their own rewards, but this is not where I'm going. The the there's another passage. I want to give, which maybe through this, it'll it, uh, help you understand where I'm going. All right, this is in the same book, uh, same gospel, Matthew, 
All right, and this is in chapter 16, verse 24. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If, uh, please excuse the background noise. Uh, I got one brother over who's in another room doing stuff and everything, so uh, sometimes it comes through, so and sometimes he may walk back and forth in the background, so kind of ignore that, all right? All right, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, verse 24 of chapter 16, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, to follow, in other, otherwise, to anyone who desires to follow him, all right? you desire to follow him? I hope your answer was in the positive, yes. If not, you need a little bit more soul searching. All right, let's go on. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and his angels. And then he will reward each according to his works. Now, the thing is, you know, also Jesus states uh, also in another passage that if uh, you know if someone you know uh, unless they you know if. They don't hate their mother or father. You don't talk about me. It don't mean I hate you. No, she's not talking about that kind of hate. Meaning that that your love for him should be in comparison for the love that you have for your family. It should be. It would be considered like hatred. But you know, in other words, Christ comes first, and they're last between Christ. Christ first. Your family last. Christ first. It don't go the 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 boat. You know I mean that, that equal thing. No, Christ first, then them. That makes it equal because that means you putting him foremost, and because your love for him, you will love your family. You know as he commands. You know, but. Where I'm going, he teaches us to, he tells us that if we want to follow him here, all right, he says that we should deny ourselves and take up his cross. You know, we should take up the cross and follow him. What is a cross? Cross means you're going to your death. The Roman people, back in those times, you understand, it wasn't a fashion. Oh, it's a cross. Oh, hey, that looks pretty cool. No, it was a terrible thing. And when he mentioned that cross, I mean, could you imagine that? Cross? That, that was a horrible death. Very horrible. We've seen horrible things, you know, people seen things in, you know, through either news or, or people who have watched movies or stuff, seen horrible things, all right? But the point is, the cross represents death. See, we have to die to ourselves and also have the knowing that following him, also we should be willing to lay down our life for him the question is are you ready to lay down your life for him would you if it meant that you had to leave your family behind 
because of your love for him that you would lay down your life to die. I'm not talking about figuratively. I'm talking about literally die for him. See, that time will come. It's a matter of when and which ones and how the situation and things go. But, but also, it does imply towards ourselves. All right, Carl, see, he says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for his sake, he says, for my sake, he said, will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world? and loses his own soul and what will a man give in exchange for his soul for the son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he will reward each according to his work and like in what I was reading here earlier in the 19th chapter of Matthew on the uh, and to focus on the 29th verse he says and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake he says shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life see I want you to you know look up through your concordance and things, you know, and just look it up, start looking in, and looking through the New Testament. And really take up and see for yourself what God's Word tells you, what about living for Him, what, you know, we should be giving up. Well, see, a lot of times people will want to, uh, well, like uh, where Jesus sits there and uh, says here in uh, Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 6, you know, he answers the Pharisees when they're uh, bringing up something about traditions and stuff, all right, here, but uh, Jesus tells them, said, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written that this people honors me with their lips but their hearts is far from me and in vain they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men for laying aside the commandment of God you hold to the, the tradition of men the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do and he says to him, all, in verse 9, he says, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Now there's many ways of traditions. Not necessarily of a religious order, but but yeah, there's many things that are tradition of man or the uh, general um, uh, fads and philosophies and stuff that... People go along with what everyone else. If one church is, you know, is doing something, people want to say, "Well, it must be okay," but it, it can't be because there is no denying of self. Well, what do you mean? Well, okay, pleasure. If you'll look in the letters of First and Second Timothy, and even in Titus. Uh, this subject is approached, you know, that men become lovers of a pleasure, you know, than lovers of God. I mean, think about it. Now, I'm not saying that a person, you know, well, if you need a vacation or, you know, something or, or whatever, I'm not, I'm not talking about vacations necessarily but what I'm, I'm trying to talk about is we focus too much on pleasure we would rather 
uh, than go to church, we would rather go fishing or go hunting or go to the ball game. We would rather sit and watch uh, the latest new program on the series that you're watching. And, it, and to go to the you know, because they, they just switched to programming and it's on my church night, so it ain't going to hurt me. Uh, you know, I mean, the question is, is what are we giving up for him? What are we denying ourselves? Are we denying ourselves pleasure and giving ourselves over to Him? Are we dying to ourselves? Are we even willing to die for Him? Paul often through the New Testament, uh, and so do the others, uh, apostles uh, speak of dying to oneself. Read the book of Romans. Now, in this evil time, in this time that we're living in, we're in the last of the last days. We get so wrapped up into our family. Now, don't get me wrong. You should love your family and be very devoted to loving your family, dedicated to loving them. But at the same time, but what I'm saying is, the question lies still, are you putting God first? Is he head? Is he the one leading the way? Think of this. Okay, suppose you lose an eye. It's bad enough if you lose two eyes, but suppose you lose an eye, whether it's poked out or just goes blind for whatever reason. Okay that there's there's darkness there you're partially in the dark so to speak but now if you lose both eyes okay you're in complete darkness right okay now if you're in complete darkness hmm not very good okay now you think about how good great it is when you're in a, a room if it's dark and you, you flip the light on and there's light you know because in the dark you're stumbling around stumping your toe and everything else see when we are not giving him our all when we're like that person who, who partially sees. You got an eye that's blinded or going blind. But eventually, it can affect the other. You know, sometimes that happens with people and stuff on and on. But bear with me. I think you know where I'm kind of going here on, on this particular subject I'm talking right now on. But see, I mean, think about it. If we go blind, we're in darkness. But we need to have a healthy eye uh, so light can come in. See, when Christ comes into us, that's light. And we need His light. But if we start flirting with the pleasures and putting our pleasures first and things, I think we're blinding ourselves. We're some, they lose it just like this spiritually because of the route that they're going. Some are, are not there yet, but they're going there. They've already lost uh, either total vision in their one eye or they're starting to go lose it or, or whatever, you know, because of the route that they're taking and the light is starting to become blurred then they're not as getting as much light in them but just think if the light that you have is darkness Jesus points out something he says how great is that darkness think about it so you know we can 
to point others' sins out. You know the old saying, uh, don't sweep my doorstep until you sweep yours. Well, see, the thing is, a lot of times a person can do wrong and not realize it. I, you, you're not beyond that. And if you say you are, you're very arrogant and you got, that's pride. The Bible speaks about pride comes before a fall and mighty, mind you, is that fall. So the question is, are you putting God first? Am I putting God first? How much time do you spend reading God's Word? Ah, but here's the rub. You can read it all you want, but that ain't going to make you any closer to God. But if you read it and soak it in, you know, think of it as reading and eating, consuming it, taking it in, and then and meditating on it. And I'm not talking about going, oh, you know, that's nonsense. Now, if you meditate, thinking it over, mulling it over, just, just thinking about what it's saying to you, what God's word, even if you, if there's something there, you, you know it's something for you, if you're not quite sure, you ask and pray. But devouring this and practicing what you read to put forth that effort to, to practice, you will get somewhere and you can grow in Him. Because people think, you know, you just because you have been 20 years in a church or or whatever, you know, or <laughs> because you're a reverend so-and-so, that you've already grown up. No, you haven't, because you're supposed to still be growing. It's a constant progress spiritually. Physically, we only grow so much. But spiritually, we're constantly growing. And because we have to, because it's a constant thing. And we haven't reached that which is perfection yet. We haven't quite even attained of all that that it is to be attained. One day we will. But the thing is, we haven't quite yet, but we gotta keep pushing, you know, and, 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 and putting forth the effort and, 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 and applying what we read. The question still lies, are you denying yourself? Are you taking up your cross? Paul said, I die daily. And think about this, when he's talking about, look what it not only was he struggling with his flesh, but he also, that he died to his flesh, the, the flesh nature, the sin nature, but also, he was facing all kinds of persecutions. You haven't struggled against sin to the, yet of shedding your blood yet. But one day you will. But the thing is, I'm afraid that some of you, when it comes to that time, you will deny me. Some of you say, I won't. But you will. Because, see, you're, you're too busy putting yourself before God. And remind you what I say to you is goes for me. I am not beyond that. I have to examine myself. You got to examine. Test yourself if you are in Christ. Are you following him? Are you in obedience to him? If not, then before you get to that place where there's no turning back, where you you veer off, and then what? Hmm? So understand, God 
has called many. So many are called. Jesus said this, and many are called, but few are chosen. There was a, a big wedding uh, banquet, right? The master, the Lord of his house, invited many people, all kinds, good and bad, all things. So they were all, when it came time for the, the big supper, the wedding, it was a wedding feast is what it was. And, and when they came in, everyone was dressed except for one fellow. He didn't want it. He wanted it his way. He wasn't dressed in a wedding garment. Everyone else was. They knew what to do. They knew what to expect. But here was a guy. He wanted it his own way. But look what happened. He was approached by the Lord of the house, of the wedding. And he said, you know, and he sits there and, and, and asks him, he says, well, you know, how is it that you're not dressed in a wedding garment? Well, this guy couldn't say nothing because he knew he was cast down. So Jesus said, when he was telling the story, he sat there and said, Many are called, but few are chosen. The call goes out. Yeah, you know, a person can all say that I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, because I came and I repeated a few words. It, it has to be from the heart. When you come to God, it's not because you repeated some words. I don't save you. It, it's from the heart. But when you come to Him and he saves you from that life. Yeah, you turned yourself around for him and everything. Understand that the road that you walk on, you know, it has to be that where you have to put yourself into it wholeheartedly. Like if I start out on a trip somewhere, let's say I'm going to go on foot. Okay, and I want to uh, to get from point A from where I start out to point B, which could be maybe 100, 200 miles, but that's a long time, a lot of rough ways on there. But if I start out first, kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, and then, uh, I don't know, you know, that's not wholehearted. You know, see, the thing is, you know, and then, you, then if I say, okay, I don't like this way, so I'm going to try, try to take another way around, a quicker way. And, and the route that is required is by foot, but maybe uh, you can go around another route where it's a lot easier and maybe you don't have to do all that walking. Well, see, that's why a lot of people, you know, you can be called on this journey to a great feast, a great wedding of the lamb but you start out you know but the thing is you know long way try to take a shortcut easier cut. many are called but few are chosen see just because you can take a, a shortcut don't mean you're gonna get there you might have been called just because you go to church don't save you. Just because maybe you do once in a while read your Bible and maybe you go to church every Sunday, uh, that on it, that's not going to save you. Uh, just because uh, you're a, a, a son or a, a daughter of a pastor, you know, that ain't going to save you. It, but here's the point. We have to really make up our minds and take a look at our lives to test ourselves. Are we in Christ? Are we denying ourselves? Are we trying to just think that we can go it our own, our way, the way we think? His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So where are we going? Where am I going? Are we dying? To ourselves, are we 
choosing our own way and thinking, you know, well, God ain't going to deny me my pleasure. I have him in my heart, you know. Do you really? Do you have something that replaces and puts something before him? Do you only pray when it's something you want? Or only when things are going bad? This would have something to have to do for you to answer and me to answer and we have to do something because it's time. And these times that we're living in, especially, I mean, look, especially when you're older, I mean, you know, like me and stuff, you know, we're not getting any younger. So the point is, we do not live forever here on this earth. We're in these mortal bodies. We do not live forever. But when we pass on, you will live forever. But the question is, where? Are you going to live forever in eternal torment, away from God, in hell, and then cast into the lake of fire, which that makes it even worse? Or are you going to live forever with Him who created us, the one who loved us and died for us? So how much do you or I love him? Because see, we're not going to live forever, and it will come. And you can sit there and say, well, I'll wait until uh, later or something, you know, uh, you give it some thought. So you need to think about it now. And if you're not a Christian, you definitely need to be thinking about it all the time. You know, because you need to think about doom and gloom. Because when you die, it ain't going to be pretty. It ain't over in this life. You think, well, when I die, it's all over. No, it's not. You just stepped over into another boundary. You left one hell. If you're not living for God, you left one hell and just stepped into something that's a lot worse. And it don't fade away and you can't leave it. But see thing is how much do you or I love him and do, do, are, are we going to deny ourselves a pleasure so like think of it like this there's people starving who needs the gospel need to be saved from hell the the question lies are we thinking well you know I'll I'll invite them or, or talk to them about Christ. Uh, I got my hunting trip, you know, I got this wedding to plan for, you know, I mean, you said things before God, and that's a fact. Truth always hurts us, but it has to be said. I mean, anything, you know, you, oh, I got this business trip, you know, and I just don't have time. Your job came before Christ. Your job means more to you than the love of God. I mean, different things that we can uh, relate here, you know, that I can use to, uh, as an analogy or something. But, but the thing is, is what are you putting first? There's people out there that's every day dying and, and going to hell. So what are we doing? We sit and enjoy our own selves and... We put that before God. We we go on uh, business, pleasure trips and all kinds of stuff. We just think about all about our pleasures. See, the Apostle Pauls and the, and, and the other apostles did not go on pleasure trips. And they, and they, and they, they were very serious. And they tried to get others to be serious. To see the necessity of one's soul being saved. They, they, you know, it was Christ first. All other things are behind. Christ didn't take pleasure cruises. And when he wanted to get off somewhere, it wasn't, I need a retreat. No, he needed to get off so he can teach his disciples. Because his time was coming to a close when he would have to leave this earth and go to be with the Father, and they needed to be instructed. But the thing is, the question
question lines. Where are we in our relationship with God? Uh, is He first? Am I putting Him first? Are you putting Him first? And if the answer is no, then we got to do something. Don't, you know, like I said, little recreation things here and there, I'm not saying that that's actually wrong. I'm talking about when we start putting, getting our priorities all discombobulated and all this, we, we send up, tend to think that it's based on ourselves. And we put everyone else that's up, that should be here, we, we put them back there. You know, when I say we put, we need to put them up there in front with Jesus right there in front with them. In other words, is to think of others more than yourself. To love them as you love yourself. You know, the, the two commands, Jesus points out that all the law is right there in those two commands. It's right there in it. And if you obey those two, you will obey it all. And that's to love God with all our hearts, with all our mind and strength, you know, with all our soul, you know, with our, with our, our whole being. If we love Him with all of our thoughts, our, Him, you know, and, and love our neighbor as ourselves, we obey the whole law. But do you love your neighbor as yourself? Do you love God? The Ten Commandments, if you if, take a good look at it. All right, and, and, and remember, you know, I heard remember someone one time said, you know, you know, you can really read too much of the Bible. Oh, yeah? Let me tell you, person who thinks that, God, through Moses, told the people, he told Moses, and, and Moses told the people, right, that they should, every day, you need to get into the Old Testament and start reading, and start from Exodus, and, you know, and, and reading the whole thing, you know, uh, Exodus, and Leviticus, and, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but let me tell you this, okay, read Exodus, and go to Deuteronomy, and you'll find something here, all right? You need to find that they were told in their every waking day is to have Him in their thoughts, in their actions, everything that He comes first. To meditate on the words, to teach it to, to their children, to talk of it constantly, every day. Oh, ow. Did that just hurt? Yeah, it does. So that's the question we got to ask ourselves. Are we putting Him first? Is He first? Do we love Him? Are we denying ourselves? Are we carrying that cross to go crucify Umwa? Huh? Are you? Am I? This is something that we have to face. And this affects everyone. Me, you, everyone. Our actions can hurt others. There is a thing that you can love people to death. But see, a lot of people get the idea of love. Loving others, you know, kind of off on a different contingent. You know, instead of like the way God says to love them. God, like God loves us, He tells, before He does anything, anybody, He warns them, He tells them, He gives them a choice. So that's what we have to do with that choice. We have to uh, think about it. And then make that choice. Do we turn left, do we turn right, or go straight? So that's the choice. Think of it like this, life and death. That's what uh, 
that's a choice God gave them. That's a choice he gives us. So there it is, laid out as plain as apple pie. So what are you going to do with it? That's a question. What am I going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? So it lies to a self-examination for each one of us. And I encourage you to stop to think on that in, in that light, that you need to consider the facts. To look it up, don't, don't go just take any old preacher John, preacher Doe, and preacher Jane and stuff, you know, I mean, a lot of you are not even looking it up. And then, but the, 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 the sad problem lies that there's people who are so arrogant. Well, I already know this. I went to seminary school or I, I studied online courses and I pretty much uh, know it all. And uh, I know what I'm talking about, so I don't have to listen to you, so I don't have to look it up because I know it. Ooh, wrong attitude wrong attitude you have to find out if what they're saying lines up does it line up you're willing to accept anything maybe uh preacher joe supposedly had an uh he might have and he might not had a near-death experience but does it line up with anything that's consistent with the word of god uh some had a vision well, that's fine. God does give people vision and to, to give to people, you know, to share it. But does it line up? The Bible talks about testing the spirits to see, huh? To see whether or not it's of God or not, right? To test the spirits. How are you going to test them? Well, how does it line up? See, a lot of people will are too busy on condemning stuff and then not taking a look at their own selves and not wanting to look in the Word. They're not wanting to ask the right questions about themselves. Where, you know, they're going, oh, how is, am I, what is my standing? Do I love Him? Uh, you know, am I denying myself? Am, am I denying me? Am I? Is this a question you're going to be asking yourself? Or are you just going to say, well, I'm fine. All is well with my soul. Are you singing that song and it's not? We have to take a look. Because now is not the time. Now is not the time to play with our eternal destination. Our eternal soul. Where we're going to be going. Because we're only a, like a, a mist, a cloud, a, a flower. You know, we, we're not here in our bodies right now. We are not forever. I mean, none of these things that you have is going to be forever. It rots. It decays. It deteriorates. It, it goes on like fads and fashions. It's here one minute, gone the next. You know, used to the fads kind of drug out, and I just boom, 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 out, in and out, and out. Everyone wants to be in with the fads, in with the fashion, and then let's bring it into the church. Let's get on with everything. It's about me, 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 me. Everyone else is there. Let's, let's just do everything and make it look like it's for uh, them, but it's for me. Oh, look at me. I can sing. I'm entertaining you. La, la, la. Oh, and I'm, I'm doing all these great deeds, but everything, is everything well with your soul? Is it well with my soul I'm not talking to just you it's for me everyone it's, it's what we got to ask ourselves not to be arrogant but to self examine us uh, you know our, ourselves where are we are we starting to go blind in one eye maybe we've already went blind in one eye maybe soon we're going to lose both eyes I'm talking spiritually here on our, our is it well with my and your soul so 
that's my question. That's that's what I wanted to to, to to get at is to give you something to think about, to understand that you know you know, a lot of people don't want to think about dying, but you better to understand that to number your day, to understand that you will gain wisdom from it. You sit there and learn to see that you're not forever in, in the clock is ticking so it's best to do something now while it is today to make the most of it you know cause the times the days are evil so let us make the most so for him to reach out and do something for him don't sit around on easy street and think about your pleasure you're supposed to be following Christ don't get that attitude well I'm a Christian and I'm eternally saved and uh, I can't lose it and I can have my pleasure and all this, you know. Don't follow that. Hooey dooey. Because see, if you can't lose your salvation, you need to read Revelations. In fact, I will help you uh, there right before I quit. Let's go there and, and let's get a point out. Uh, it's one of the let. it's uh, uh, there's uh, seven letters uh, that the Lord directed John to give to these seven churches. Okay. All right. I want you to bear with me. Do, do, do. All right. Uh, let's see. I think it's which one is that? See, we got uh, one in Ephesus, and, well, okay, let's take a look at this one first, all right. Mind you, listen to what, all right, if you'll read uh, chapter 2, uh, going through verses 1 through 7 of Revelations chapter 2. All right, now, first I want you to take a look at something here. All right, now here's some good things that's going for this church in Ephesus. <coughs> like verse 2, he says, I know your work, your labor, your patience. Sounds good so far. He says, and that you, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. So far, so good, right? Okay, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Excellent. Now, he says, nevertheless, check this out. Nevertheless, I have this against you. That's not so good. That is not so good. He says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. He's not, I'm not talking about the love of, of the, the world. He's talking about the love for Christ, for God. You know, Him alone. You know. He says, remember therefore from where you have fallen repent repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its from its place unless you repent the lampstand remind you if you will sit there and you will look in the first chapter uh, in the 20th uh, verse, he sits there and tells plainly what, what the lampstands represent, and that's the church. He will move the church, the church here of Ephesus. You know, you know. Wow. Okay, but now let's let's kind of uh, go on. All right, and he says, "He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who over." comes I will give I will give to eat from the tree of life 
which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, if you look what he says to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Alright, he says, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life faithfulness, putting him first, loving, laying it down. These people were persecuted. They were dying to flesh and, and to their self, you know, the sin nature. They were dying to that and and, and, and they were laying, uh, putting their lives on the line for God. Him first. But he goes on. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcome shall not be hurt by the second death. Okay. And now, uh, and to the angel of the church of Pergamos. Right. All right, verse, ter uh, verse 13 says, I know your works and where you dwell where, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwelt. But listen to this. But I have a few things against you because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. There's too much of this going on. Oh, he looks so sexy. Oh, she's a fox sexy. And he do this in a church. Your mind is been warped by society. What you see by the media. You're, you're going along with it. And the churches are bringing this in. And, you know, I mean, the... Stuff that, that, that comes across, you know, thinking about money, you know, and all this getting wrapped into the prosperity thing. That that's that's not gospel. Prosperity is a good news that will lead you straight to hell and not benefit no one. And least of all, it won't benefit you. But anyway, you talk, I'm talking about you gotta put God first. He says, thus you also have those who hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Check this out. He says, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And let's go on down. All right, to the church uh, and to the angel of the church, verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, or Thyatira, as some would say, write, these things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. Now listen to what he says. Now here we go again. I'm trying to get you to focus on something because you so and so and you can't lose your salvation. Nobody can cause no one can take away your salvation, but you by your choices you can lose out on it. This is what they're not saying. Or if that's what they're you know, you know, the people don't make themselves clear on it, because he says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Now, sexual immorality consists every sexual perverse thing. 
homosexuality is that. Any kind of adultery is that. Any any kind of bestiality, or anything, it's all sexual immorality, and it is against God. Okay, and there's other things, but let's go on. He says, and I gave. Uh, he goes, uh, my uh, all right. Verse twenty-one. He says, and I gave her time to repent. Gave her time to repent. Of her sexual immorality in God's grace. He gives us time to repent. But we waste it on ourselves. But he says, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. So you understand repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. That's all you did was say you're sorry. Repent means not just to say you're sorry, but to show it. The fruit of repentance. Where you are doing a complete turn, you're turning away from what you're saying you're sorry for, you, the wrong that you're doing, that you turn around. The action, not the words. Words alone are cheap. But he says, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest, and Thyatira, or Thyatira, as many as do not have the doctrine, who do, who do not have this doctrine, the, this Jezebel doctrine thing, he says, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on, and he says, uh, I read that wrong, he says, I now to you I say, and to the rest, uh, and the theatera, as many as uh, do not have the doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. He said, But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And then let's skip down. All right, to the angels uh, in the church of Sardis. All right, he says uh, here, and uh, here where he goes. He says the, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, and that you are alive, but you were dead. I think a lot of us fit in, in, in today are in this category. Be watchful. And strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die, that is about to die. That's what he's saying. He says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect, uh, complete, uh, mature before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold Fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Now hear this. Listen to this. Let me go back over this and let me finish it. But I want you to focus on this verse. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. He who overcomes. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Now, if you cannot lose salvation, then how can 
be a possibly uh, the possibility of these people having their names blotted out. If God can erase something, that means that then it can be taken back. He can change his mind. He can, you know, that mean you know if you flaunt something, you know, throw it back at them. You think, you know, a lot of people say, well, they weren't really saved. That might be true in some or a lot of different cases, but mind you, there have been men who have lived for God. And we're talking about a genuine faith. And, I mean, God worked in their lives. It was in their lives. But they got stumped somewhere along the way and they veered off. We got a good examples in this. In uh, if you start reading uh, first and second uh, Kings and first and second Chronicles, if you would read it and see what happened to these kings, you had some godly ones, and it made a turn the wrong way. They had the right place and everything, but people seem to you know focus on it's my salvation is eternal. It's it's secure. Well, if someone gives you something for free, let's say a car, well, that's a free gift, and it's given to you. It's yours, but you got to maintain it. I'm not talking about works. Don't even go there with me on that. That's wrong. Works is wrong. It don't get you nowhere. But the thing is, by works with faith, or faith or as the result of your salvation works, Okay, as the result of, there is works. All right, but the thing is, if you turn around and you, you something happened and you turn around and you veer off, you mean to tell me you, you, that whole thing wasn't really true? You know, I, I, you know, I don't understand that thinking. The people are... We're, are, are we walking in a fog? Are we are we deluding ourselves? Where is our... Are we loving Him? Are we losing it? Are we starting to go into darkness? Because understand, a person can start out that way in the light. They can veer off. I don't care what other people think. But you have to read it. Don't read cherry picking. I see too many of them cherry picking. Uh, there's uh, verses in Ezekiel. If you will read the the, uh, and, and I challenge you to read it, where you know when it talks about the watchman, his responsibility to tell others to warn them that if a righteous man turns from turns from his righteousness to do to do wicked, takes a w wicked path, you know. That he will die. But if he was to, you know, but if he was to come back to God, all of the, his former things that he did won't be remembered. You know, like, you know, but the thing is, a person can make a wrong decision. We're God, you know, He gives us free will. He don't force us. The same as that free will He gives us to come to Him when He calls us. We say, we, yes. Or we can say no. But if we, yes, you know, we come to Him, but then, you know, then we can turn around and, you know, I'm tired of this. I'm not happy with it. And make all kinds of excuses. And, Turn around and go the wrong direction. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Now, a person cannot cause you to lose your salvation. Nobody can. It is you who can do it. Not uh, anybody or anything, just you can cause that. But the thing is, we can lose out in so many ways. And... The question is, what are we going to do? You know, is our is our are we sincere in our walk with God? 
you know, do you want, do you want to go to heaven? Do I want to go to heaven? Or do you or me, do, do I want to go to hell? I think only a fool would want to say, yeah, I want to go to hell. That's a fool. And I know this was long when, and I apologize. But I wanted you to think, you know, there's different things here. I mean, to, you know, look, to examine ourselves on. I could go on and on and on, you know. But the thing is, it's something that we have to think about in our life choices, in our, well, you know, oh, where we stand before Him. Is he, is he our love? Is he our God? I mean, do we love him with all our heart? Why don't we say we do? But our actions are not showing. Because see, if we love him with all our heart, with all our soul, our being, our mind, our strength, then only sounds reason that you would follow his command. You know, and what else did he say? Is to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus gave us one. And he said to love each other, to love one another as he loved us. Not just to the disciples, that goes for us. So, I want to encourage you to look it up. Don't take just John Doe's and let them try to warp your mind and, and sitting there telling you how to read it. God, if you pray to him, if you're not for sure, pray and ask him to open your eyes and read it. You know, just don't just take solely that person's word alone because it's preacher so-and-so or, well, that was, a, a, I know them for a long time. Don't just take him or my word for it. Because sometimes we can not intentionally, but sometimes we can get something wrong or be partly right, partly wrong with you, but you want, don't want to take that chance with your soul, with your life, your, uh, you know, He is everything, God. Don't take my word. No, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to, to hear what God's word says, look and read it for yourself. And, and ask God to direct you and lead you. If you really love Him. If you want to go to heaven. You know, if you don't want to lose out. If you don't want to lose that beautiful reward. To be able to be with Him forever. Then, please. Let, let us all. Every single one of us to to examine ourselves and see how we stand before God. I encourage you, please, think about it. Don't pass it off. Please listen to what I'm saying. Check it out. Check it out. Don't take just anybody's word. What does the Bible say? Because too many people who, uh, who uh, sit there and just took solely uh, whatever preacher or person up there was just word for it have followed right along that person who is blind teaching them, leading them straight into the ditch which leads to hell. And you don't want that. I mean, why take that chance? Examine for yourself to see what does God's word say. And, and, and check it out, weigh it out. Remember the Roman Catholic Church back in the Dark Ages and things, remember how they were. You know, they didn't want people to have any other Bibles written in the common language of the everyday language. They wanted it in Latin, I know, and all this. And they didn't like it. You know, they give them room to go that they had all the power and that they could interpret it as they will so that they could have control. Don't be controlled by people. Be controlled by God, by His Spirit. Do not be controlled by man. 
I can mislead you. Someone else can mislead you. But God doesn't mislead you. I'm not saying don't go to church. Don't everything I did. I mean, you should be obedient to the man of God. But the whole thing is, he, if he loves God too, and loves you, I mean, cares about you, he'll want you to examine what he's saying, to check it out. Look at, be a Berean, like in the book of Acts, to look it up. You understand I'm saying what I'm saying? I'm not telling you don't, uh, you know, to rebel against uh, churches and start some kind of uh, thing there. I mean, you know, but if that preacher's not preaching the truth, then you shouldn't be there. But you need to be where in a church where they preach the truth and, and where God moves, not where man, what man wants, obey God. So think about it. That's all I'm asking. Think about it. And I, you know, I apologize for taking so long, but I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm really concerned for you, for myself, for everyone. I mean, we. This is not the time for us to just ah, you know. I already know all that. I already got a pastor. You know, I got somebody else you know. You don't want to go that route, because then you got pride and arrogancy. That gets you nowhere. You don't get me anywhere. If somebody's wrong, they're wrong, okay? If somebody's right, they're right. But I stand, check it out. That's why people get duped by those uh, telephone salesmen, you know? Oh, yeah. Somebody comes knocking on your door, you know, they got your name and number, all right, you know, and they can talk at talk, and you done bought into something and got yourself snookered, and you're out of money. Follow Christ. You can't go along there. But are you following him? Is he first? Are you dying to yourself? Have you denied yourself? For him, denying yourself. Think about it. So let me just say until then, until next time, God bless you, Shalom, and I hope.